So what we'll do today is uh, continue our discussion on uh, flow through uh, curved geometries. Till now in the past what you were really looking at is uh, flow through uh, you know systems where we use the rectangular Cartesian coordinates okay. And uh, what we will do today is talk about uh, flow through a curved pipe and uh, the basic idea is first of all it does not really matter I mean whether it is a curved geometry or whether it is a rectangular Cartesian coordinate system the methods are the same. And uh, we also want to illustrate two ideas both of which are based on perturbation expansions. So, what you saw in the last two classes was uh, how you can actually uh, analyze flow through a curved pipe. Okay, so, you have a circular pipe which is bent and how you can find what the velocity profile is or the velocity field is in this curved pipe using a perturbation series solution. Okay. So, that is one idea that is what we are trying to do there is we are trying to find the base solution in terms of a perturbation series the solution itself the, and how do you do that you know what the flow through a straight pipe is the flow through a straight pipe is your classical uh, Hagen Poisel equation with your parabolic velocity profile. And when you, you, you treat that as your base solution and then you do a perturbation series solution okay you seek a solution for the curved pipe and there is a small parameter the small parameter will be the radius through which it is bending. So, if your pipe is not you know bending uh, very drastically but only gradually bending. So, the gradual bending is represented by some kind of a small dimensionless parameter epsilon and then you seek your solution in terms of a perturbation series solution and have your base state and then your first order solution tells you how the Dean's vortices are actually induced okay. So, that is what we saw uh, in the last two classes. What we will do today is again talk about a problem where you have flow through a curved channel. Now, it is not a pipe it is actually a channel okay and uh, we will do a stability of a flow using the same perturbation series solution. The idea is to show to you that there are two things we have been doing in this course one is using perturbation series approach to find solutions number one using perturbation series solutions uh, perturbation series approach to find stability. So, I just wanted to use this example to illustrate that the two different things we are doing. Okay, and I want you to uh, we want to do this in an explicit way so that you are clear that there are two different things we are trying to do using perturbation series solution. So the first thing that we've done is uh, flow through a curved pipe. Okay, if the pipe is gently curved then a small parameter and this is what you have seen so far a small parameter epsilon arises in the equation when epsilon equals 0 we have flow through a straight pipe okay and that is you know what the classical solution for that is the Hagen Poisel flow okay. So, the classical solution for this is the Hagen Poisel flow 
okay, the parabolic velocity profile. When you are going to bend it, when epsilon is positive and small, what is going to happen is you have these centrifugal forces which come into the picture. Okay, as a result of which, in addition to the axial velocity, you also have velocity components along the cross section because the fluid element is going, has a tendency to be thrown outwards. Okay, and then you have a circulation set in. The there are uh, vortices or circulation patterns established along the cross section and what we wanted to do is we wanted to find out this, this flow field where the velocity field gets modified. In the, in the straight channel you have only the axial component of velocity, you do not have any other component V theta, okay. you do not have any uh, Vr, you only have Vz, the axial component of velocity. But now in addition to the theta component because it is curved which is along the axis, you also have the other components which come. Okay. So now this can be obtained. using a perturbation series solution, okay. So what I am saying is if you have a straight pipe and there is a pressure driven flow. Okay, this is a delta p across. We have the parabolic velocity profile. Okay, and this corresponds to the case of epsilon being equal to zero. But now, if you have a curved pipe. the pipe is bent, there is a radius of the pipe or the diameter of the pipe and there is an axis about which, about which it is being bent. Let us say this is capital R. Okay. So, Rp by R equals epsilon. If epsilon is small, r is infinity, r is large and is only gradually being bent and what is going to happen is when the fluid is flowing, now the flow is in the theta direction, okay. This is the theta direction. Here the flow was in the z direction, remember, okay. So the flow is in the theta direction you have not only the v theta component of velocity but also the other components of velocity which show up. Point I am trying to make here is if as epsilon tends to 0, it is going to collapse to this case. So what we can do is we can try to find a solution to the actual velocity field to the flow profile in this by using a Taylor series expansion by using a perturbation series solution. Okay, and then we are able to find the base state plus a collection term, and then you get your um, vortices. Okay, so this is one way by which I can actually use the perturbation series solution to find a solution, to find an estimate of the solution. Of course, what you can do is you can do this thing by uh, some computational fluid dynamics and also try to find the solution. Okay, and then verify your approximate solution with uh, what you got using CFD. So, this is one application of um, your perturbation series solution. What we are going to do today is look at 
another application, but something similar, a similar problem. The problem is again, a, this is a second application. Is to find stability of flows. So, what I am trying to do here is uh, maybe I should complete this here. The first application is the first application is to find an approximate solution using the small parameter epsilon occurring in the governing equations. Okay, that is what you saw. That is the first application. Now, the second application is to find stability of the flow. Here, epsilon determines the magnitude of the perturbation. Okay. I mean here you have a system, the small parameter that you are talking about is not something which is occurring naturally in the system. You find a base state and now you are giving a small perturbation and then you are trying to do your stability analysis by doing the linearization. Okay. So, there are two different things. One, the parameter epsilon occurs naturally in the equation and then you are saying I want to find out how things behave for small epsilon, do a Taylor series expansion. That is what we did earlier. Now, I am saying I have a system where epsilon does not really occur in the system, but I am going to give epsilon order perturbations and see how the perturbations are going to grow. Okay. So, what is the problem that we are going to talk about now? We are going to talk about this problem of flow through a curved channel. Okay. So, what is the meaning of a channel? I'm, I have two walls which are bent okay, and these are two arcs which are concentric. So, there is a particular center and let us say this is R1 and this is R2. Okay. Those are two concentric walls. And there is a pressure driven flow in the gap between the walls. So, you are used to you know two walls which are parallel in your rectangular Cartesian coordinates. I am talking about two walls which are kind of parallel in cylindrical geometry. Okay. So, again there is a delta p here. And because of this delta p, there is a flow. The point I am trying to make here is, is there going to be a base flow here? That is, can I have a solution which is can be looked upon as a base state about which I can, whose stability I can find out. See, when I am talking about a stability problem, I need to have a base state. Okay. So, now, supposing you have rectangular walls okay, and parallel, then what would be the base state? It would be again your parabolic velocity profile. Okay. So, the point is here, can we have a base state which is slightly modified form of a parabolic velocity profile? So, can a base state exist here? which has only the v theta 
component of velocity. Okay, so I have your uh, a curved pipe, pressure drop is imposed and I am asking the question is it possible for you to have only a V theta component of velocity. So, this is something like your fully developed flow case which you have in flow through rectangular channels where the flow is only in the direction of the pressure gradient and it does not change with the direction of the flow. Okay. So, how can you find out if such a solution exists? You go back like you did earlier, you would go and find out uh, put V r equal to 0, V z equal to 0. In this case, z is going to be, so we, what are the three directions that we have? This is the theta direction, this is the r direction and z is outside the plane of the board. Okay. So, we are and since I am assuming it to be infinite in the z direction, clearly you can seek a solution where V z is 0. Okay. There is no flow in the z direction. Now, the pressure drop is in the theta direction, therefore, you will have a flow in the theta direction, V theta will be non-zero and uh, this wall is solid, this wall is solid. So, V r is 0 at these two walls and we can seek a solution where there is no flow in the radial direction. Okay. So, this is definitely a base state and this is analogous to your parabolic velocity profile which you would get for flow through flat plates. Okay. So, the question now is if I keep increasing this velocity profile, the pressure drop, if I keep inc increasing the flow rate through this channel, is it that I will always have this kind of a parabolic velocity profile of my base state or is it that I might get an instability and get a solution which is going to have different velocity components. So, this is a problem which is very similar to what we had when we are talking about the rayleigh binard convection problem. We have a base state and then we are trying to find out as we increase the temperature gradient, we are trying to find out whether convection sets in. So, the question is that now here there is no um, temperature gradient. Okay. If there is going to be an instability, it is going to be primarily caused by the centrifugal forces. Okay. The, so, when the flow is in the theta direction, the centrifugal forces are going to have a uh, effect of trying to throw the fluid element outwards as a result of which you can get circulation patterns which is what you saw earlier. What is it that is preventing it? Again, it is viscosity. So, there is a basically a competition between viscous forces and the centrifugal forces. For very low values of this velocity, the viscous forces are going to dominate and you have your laminar velocity profile. I will call this my laminar velocity profile. Okay. So, let us look at this thing. So, consider a, the solution with V theta which is a function only of R, V z equal to 0 and V r equal to 0 is a laminar flow solution. Here, although I have a centrifugal force present, it is not strong enough for me to have induced an instability. Okay. For lower values of V theta, the centrifugal force is going to be given by V theta squared by R. The viscous force is going to be given by viscosity multiplied by the velocity gradient. Okay. So, for low flow rates, flow rates, the inertial effects are dominated by viscous forces okay, and we have your laminar profile. But as you keep increasing the flow rate, as you keep increasing the pressure drop, the inertial term or the centrifugal term is going to dominate and you will get an instability. That is, this state is not something which you are going to be able to observe, but you will see some kind of a circular pattern. 
vortices are going to be induced okay and these vortices would be periodic in the z direction okay so depending on how you want to view this either you are changing the flow rate or you are changing the pressure drop okay so either we change delta p or the flow rate and of course i'm talking only about one liquid single phase okay so beyond a critical delta p we expect centrifugal forces to dominate and a convection pattern to be induced in this z direction the flow will now become three dimensional that is you already have v theta you will have vz because it is going to be infinite in the z direction so you have periodicity in the z direction okay like you have seen earlier and then uh, from continuity you will see that there's also vr component okay what i'm going to do see actually this particular problem has actually been solved by a guy called sparrow and uh, what we will do is we will uh, i will send the uh, paper out to all of you the solution the linearized equations everything is actually given there what and then also the uh, how to go about finding the critical uh, boundary at which you have the onset of the uh, instability okay so what you have to do is you actually have to work through the paper and that is something which is doable with this course that you've done that is you should be able to find the uh, base solution which is given in the paper you should be able to find the linearized equations which is given in the paper the thing which i want to really focus on is on how to solve the linearized equations and get the neutral stability curve okay that is what i'm i'm going to explain because he has explained it in the paper but i want to explain it so that then you can go up, go back and write a computer code to actually find the neutral stability curve okay so i just want to be clear about what exactly the plan is so this problem is analyzed by this gentleman called sparrow okay and uh, the paper will come to you you need to find the base state and verify it verify it because sparrow has given you the base state so this is very straight forward just like a parabolic velocity profile now v theta is the only component which varies in r put the nose slip boundary conditions and evaluate that's all and he's made things dimensionless in a certain way i suggest you guys follow the same method so there's no confusion then you need to that's your base state you go to the uh, navier stokes equations you will be writing the navier stokes equations in all the three directions v r v theta v z and you'll be doing the linearization okay so then you linearize the navier stokes equations in the three directions r theta and z okay so the geometry is clear right r is in the direction which is uh, between the two plates in the radial direction z is outside the plane of the board and theta is the flow direction okay linearize the navier stokes equations and uh, then you would have to do the same thing what we've been doing all along eliminate the pressure and get things in terms of only the 
velocity components. And you know how to do that. You just do some cross differentiation, get rid of the pressure, and then get equations with the velocity components. Okay. So after you realize the equations, you will seek solutions of the form For example, V theta perturbation will be of the form V theta star of R e power sigma t times uh, cosine k z. Okay. Now. What you see here is, in general, V theta, the perturbation will depend upon all the three coordinates, R, theta and Z, okay. But we are looking for solutions which are independent of theta. That means the new steady state, new, uh, uh, after the onset of instability is also fully developed is also not changing with theta. Okay? So basically what this means is, if you see convection patterns, they are going to be convection patterns not in the R theta plane, but they will be in the R z plane. Okay? So what I am saying is, the perturbations are also, shall we call it fully developed Aye. independent of theta. The circulations are in the R Z plane, R and Z, okay, and not in the R theta plane. So imagine this periodic cells coming outside the plane of the board, not along the plane of the board, okay, and that is the reason. So, in some sense, we simplify things a little bit by looking for solutions which are independent of theta. Okay? So, I have cosine k z, clearly that is the direction in which things are going to go to infinity, and uh, so it is periodic. This is my growth rate, and that is my r dependency. So, because in the r direction, I have these boundary conditions which I have to apply. Okay? Uh, there is also a subtle uh, point which uh, I want to emphasize here. When you look at the solution and this particular expansion, he actually discusses in the paper. So, three of the variables are in phase and one of the variables is out of phase. That is, if you are assuming cosine kz, vr and the pressure will be varying as cosine kz, but vz perturbation varies as sine kz. Okay? So, that is something which uh, is explained in the paper or is given in the paper. Okay? So, remember uh, I, I believe the Vz component, Vz tilde is out of phase with the other perturbations, which means what I am trying to say here is that this is of the form Vz of R, Vz star of R, E power sigma T sin Kz. Okay? And that will come to you only when you solve substituting in the uh, equation. Of course, one way to avoid this problem is just assume E power I Kz and proceed. Okay. After you have done this, uh, after you have assumed this form, 
what will you do? You will go back and substitute it in your linearized equations and then you get ordinary differential equations in the r direction, okay. And uh, so we substitute this form of the perturbation equations and get OD is in the R direction. So, clearly the theta direction has been removed because we are assuming things are independent of theta. The z direction has been removed because we are assuming periodic in z. So, when I substitute back the only thing that is going to be remaining is going to be the r direction, okay. That is what I want because in the r direction is where I am imposing my boundary conditions, okay. So, okay. Now, um, we are going to again not worry about the formal proof, but we are going to say that the transition to instability is going to occur through a real sigma crossing the imaginary axis that is sigma is not complex conjugate, okay. So, that means uh, the transition to instability occurs by a, I will call it real sigma becoming positive. So, what does that imp imply? A real sigma becoming positive? That means that the new state that I am going to get is also going to be a steady state. If the sigma, if the real part of sigma is going to be positive, that means that also an imaginary part, the imaginary part is going to make it oscillate periodically in time. Now, there is no imaginary part, so there is no oscillation in time. So, what that means is after I cross my threshold uh, delta p, there is going to be a vortex induced and this new solution is also going to be a steady state solution, okay. Just like what we had for the Rayleigh Binard problem, although we have not proven all these things, okay. But uh, just to tell you that the implication of a real sigma as opposed to a real part of sigma, real part of sigma means there is also an imaginary part, okay. So, a real sigma being positive, th this implies the new steady state, so the new state is also steady, the new state is also a steady state. Okay. So, I hope it is clear when I say, say sigma is your growth rate, growth rate can be real or it can be imaginary co complex conjugate. So, if it is real and that is the one which is going to decide the change from stable to unstable, if it is real then the new solution is going to be a steady state solution and that is what we are assuming right now. In fact, it is not really an assumption, you can actually prove it, but if it turns out that it is actually the real part of a complex number sigma e power sigma t there is also going to be an imaginary part, the imaginary part is going to make it uh, give it a periodic dependency in time, okay. This periodic dependency in time means the flow now becomes unsteady because at every point things are changing in time. So, what we are going to do now is when it comes to trying to find the transition from stable to unstable because that is what we are interested in doing, we are trying to find out the point at which it is just going to become unstable, we are just going to substitute sigma equal to 0 because 
And remember, that's what we did for the Rayleigh Bernard problem. To find the neutral stability curve, we're going to put sigma equal to 0. We don't put sigma equal to i omega. Okay? So now, we put sigma equal to 0 to get the neutral stability curve. So now, what do I have? I have equation of continuity and I have three equations of momentum, the navier stokes equation in the three directions. Okay? So now I need to do my elimination business, get rid of pressure, get rid of uh, one of the velocity components. So, and that's what is done here. We eliminate V theta and pressure V theta star and P star and obtain ordinary differential equations in <coughs> no, not V theta star. Yeah. V R star and V Z star. And this you know how to do. I mean, you, you, this is exactly what we've been doing all along. We've been looking at uh, eliminating pressure by taking the curl of the equation or doing some cross derivative. Okay. The f fact is, what the paper has is we have a fourth order ordinary differential equation in one velocity component. That is v theta and a second order ordinary differential equation in another velocity component. Okay, so this is basically this fourth order ordinary differential equation and second order ordinary differential equation is actually given in the paper and this is what you guys have to derive just by doing this elimination. Okay? So, he's not given the in between steps, but then you guys have to work through the steps. The methodology is clear and get those two equations. Now, and of course, I do not know what these equations are, but what I do remember know is that these guys clearly if you have fourth order equation and a second order equation, you need to have boundary conditions. right? So, the boundary conditions of this system are, I am going to use the same notation as what I think Sparrow has used. He uses u for the fourth order variable and v for the second order variable. It is u equals du by dr. In fact, it should be du by dr equals v equals 0 at the inner wall and outer wall. So, there are two walls, right? And you have the no slip boundary condition, you have the uh, boundary condition where things do not penetrate. So, all those when you use, these are the equations you would get. Now, two rigid walls. Clearly, I have a fourth order equation and I have a second order equation. So, that means I need six boundary conditions. Okay. So, three boundary conditions are specified at this wall and three at the other wall. And that means everything is fine, you are all set to solve. Okay. Theoretically, you can solve for this problem. Now, of course, since this is a linearized equation, this is a linearized system, it is also a, a homogeneous system. What does that mean? That means the boundary conditions are homogeneous, there is no term which is a source term which can make this thing non zero. Similarly, in the differential equation also, the 
every term will contain u the derivative of u second derivative of third derivative fourth derivative second derivative of v and so uh, etc hmm? and what will happen is this equation will contain what equation will contain k and Reynolds number. So, how exactly the k and how the Reynolds number is defined you can just check the paper. K of course is a periodicity, k is the periodicity of the wave of the uh, form, the wave number, the wave length that we have in the z direction. Reynolds number tells you something about the flow rate. Okay. And remember what are we interested in doing? We are trying to find out for a particular k what is the Reynolds number for which I have a non-zero solution. Okay. So, now this is a slightly tricky problem in the sense in the Rayleigh Binet convection we just guess the solutions we said this sin n pi z and then we said look uh, we will go about getting our curve and then we uh, understood how this curve is uh, found out. But now the challenge is how do you solve this problem? Now you, you did the entire thing okay, found the base steady state, found the uh, linearization, found the boundary conditions. How, how do you go about solving this problem? So, the thing that you would do and that is basically what I want to explain. How do you find, how do we find a non-zero solution to the problem? Remember at the beginning of this class I spoke something about using epsilon for doing a stability. Okay, the epsilon I have not mentioned explicitly, but epsilon is in the small perturbation that I have given. Okay, but now I am talking about a stability problem, whereas what you did earlier was try to find the solution itself. So, that subtle difference or whatever not so subtle difference you guys should be very clear about. What, what is the guy doing? Is he trying to find a solution or is he trying to find stability? So, now I am talking about finding stability. How do we find a non-zero solution to the problem? This is a boundary value problem BVP. So, how do you normally go about solving a boundary value problem? Especially when you have three boundary conditions on the left, three boundary conditions at the other wall, three boundary conditions at one wall, three boundary conditions at the other. Normally what you would do is you would assume some kind of a non-zero solution and remember you want a non-zero solution. So, you say oh well look I am going to do finite difference, I will finite difference this thing, I will give a guess and I am going to get satisfy these boundary conditions and I am going to write my code for Newton Raphson or whatever algorithm you want to use and try to seek a solution, right. What is going to happen if you do that? If you do that your computer does not know that you are looking for a non-zero solution. The computer says I only want to find a solution. So, the computer is always going to converge on the zero solution because it says look you want a solution, zero is the solution which satisfies the differential equation and the boundary conditions, right. So, you, you are going to give different initial guesses and start praying to God that the, the program is going to work, right. But then uh, if you do not play strong enough and it does not matter how strong enough you play you are not going to get your solution because the computer is going to just go to the zero solution. I hope you understand what I am saying. So, the point is this is a boundary value problem. We could use a finite difference scheme because you learned it in one of the earlier courses okay and uh, you say look finite difference is going to work and seek a solution, but the equation is linear and homogeneous. So, it always admits the trivial solution and the computer will always
कन्वर्ज टू दिस ट्रिवियल सोल्यूशन एंड दैट बेसिकली डिफीट्स द पर्पज ओके बिकॉज यू वॉन्ट अ नॉन जीरो सोल्यूशन इट विल never find a non zero solution no matter what you do so then you say well uh, and that's basically what i want to explain uh, if not today at least tomorrow so that you can write your code and uh, and this is basically what is also explained in the paper how to go about finding the solution so the other thing you can do is you can convert this boundary value problem to something like an initial value problem and do what is called a shooting method so everybody has heard shooting method before somewhere so we could convert this bvp to an initial value problem and use a shooting method technique i'll explain what this technique is right now but i'll also tell you that this method also will not work for the same reason as earlier it will again go to the zero solution alone i have a fourth order equation and a second order equation right so i'm going to convert this to an initial value problem means i have to specify all six conditions at the one of the walls so okay so let us say i'm specifying all the six three are already given i need to specify three more at the inner wall okay so that means here we specify all six conditions at the inner wall three i know the other three i don't know so what will be those conditions on is a fourth order equation in u which means i can specify the second derivative and the third derivative in u is a second order equation in v so i can specify v and the first derivative okay that means we specify u double dash and u triple dash and v dash also at the inner wall okay so how do you but this is not physical right so what you have to do is you will guess these three conditions the values for these three variables and you will integrate now it becomes an initial value problem so now you can actually do an uh, range kata or an euler's method because all the conditions are specified at the inner wall and you can integrate forward in the radial direction and you will check if these conditions at the outer wall you will integrate up to the outer wall and see if the velocities uh, these conditions at the outer wall are satisfied okay if the u the du by dr and the v at the outer wall are zero and uh, typically this would work if your system is not linear and homogeneous if your system is linear and homogeneous again these guys what the computer will do is it will tell you u double prime equal to zero u triple prime equal to zero v prime equal to zero is a solution and you will get zero as the uniform solution okay so even the shooting method is not going to work you understand what i'm saying so here um we actually guess guess u double prime u triple prime and v prime and iterate on the guesses till the 
conditions on the outer wall u equals u prime equals v equal to 0 are satisfied. So, yeah, I have to solve these three equations. I need to make sure that these three conditions are satisfied and for that I need three variables. The three variables are the guess values of u double prime, u triple prime and v prime. I have to find what these are so that this is satisfied. But what the computer is going to do is going to tell me, look, u double prime, u triple prime and v prime are 0, that will satisfy this. So, you go back to the same problem as what you had earlier, okay. So, how do you overcome this problem and we will we'll see how to overcome this problem tomorrow.